After I said in my last video that AI does 90% of my coding, you made it clear you wanted me to make a video showing you my AI workflow. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. My name is Chris, I build productivity apps. I have four productivity apps that I work on and they're pretty robust apps. And the reason I mention that is because anytime someone finds out that I'm the one behind these apps, they always ask, how is this possible? So there's a couple of reasons, but the main reason is because I use AI to supercharge my workflow. I'm not exaggerating. If I had to estimate, I think I'm outputting 10 times more than I did a few years ago before I started using AI. So there are two pretty extreme opinions of AI right now. Some people say it's gonna replace all developers. No one should learn how to code anymore. And then a lot of people say it just spits out garbage. It's not worth using. And after using AI for coding for almost two years, building four productivity apps, I can confidently say that the truth is somewhere in the middle. If you're on the fence about using AI for coding, this video is for you. Maybe you've tried GitHub Copilot in the past and you're pretty underwhelmed, or you've heard so much conflicting stuff that you don't even wanna start. I get it, I was skeptical too, but after a lot of iteration and exploring a bunch of tools, I finally found the workflow that works for me. And now I think AI writes like 90% of my code. So if you checked out my last video, you know I built the prototype of Lily, my new meeting assistant tool, in about a week. I'm not exaggerating, I think the same prototype would have taken me one to two months to build if I wasn't using AI. So this is a really big difference. I'm pretty bullish on using these tools, so hopefully this video convinces you to try it out, or if you've done it in the past and it wasn't for you, maybe try again. So I actually did develop a more methodical approach to developing features, and it involves four steps, and for some reason I found that when I follow these four steps, there's less errors and there's less mess for me to clean up. So at a high level, the four steps are, I build the UI first with dummy data so it's not hooked up to anything. Once the UI is done and I'm happy with it, then I have the AI build out the data structures and the back end. Once I'm happy with that and everything looks good, then I have the AI connect both of them. Then I go in and do more cleanup, polishing, more advanced interactions, animations, all at the very end. So those are the four steps. Let me run through why it works and some examples. So the first step, I have the AI build all the UI with dummy data. The reason I do this is it gives the AI less to think about when it doesn't have to think about the back end, doesn't have to think of the data structure, it can just focus on getting the UI correct. I have found that it executes it a lot better than trying to do all of it at once. So for Lily, the meeting assistant app, I gave it this prompt. It's a very basic prompt. I didn't give it any complex styling. I just want the UI to work. But doing it this way has a lot of benefits because I can quickly see it on the screen, figure out, okay, is this what I really want? Make any adjustments if I need it. And more importantly, it gives the AI a better picture of what data structures and data models are needed to work with this UI. And that's step number two. Once you have the UI, get it to create the data structure in the back end. So in this case, I'm using Superbase, so I told it, based on the UI we've built, create a data model for the meetings, the transcript messages, and generate the SQL commands I need to set this up in Superbase. Cursor Hardy has access to my entire code base, so it knows what the screens look like, it knows what a meeting is, and it actually returned the complete data models in Swift, gave me the schema with all the relationships and the SQL commands that I needed to run with Superbase, and it actually all worked the first time, which I was a little surprised by, because this is a pretty massive project already, but I was able to just copy the SQL commands, paste them into Superbase, obviously double check them before I ran them, but it did work, and it's set it up perfectly, save me, I don't even know how many hours. So that's step number two. Step number three is let's connect everything. I didn't do this step all at once because I was worried it wasn't gonna be able to get it in one go. So I went feature by feature. So I said, for example, update the meeting list view to fetch real meetings from Superbase instead of dummy data and add any loading states and error handling. And because it already had the front end code and it already had the back end in the schema, this part was actually really, really easy. And that last phase is just to polish and iterate on the UI. So this is where I add a bunch of complex interactions and I make a bunch of changes. And my tip is to keep it small I try to cap my changes at two or three changes. So for example, I would probably tell it something like, can you make the corner radius larger? Add a light shadow and make it a font that looks like a typewriter. So that's about three requests right there. I found the less you ask it, the higher chance it has of actually executing it. I just do this over and over again until I'm happy with the UI. And this phase usually takes a lot of time, but honestly not that bad with AI. So those are the four steps I usually take for most features. It's UI, data, hook it up, and then polish. I got my tool, now you got my steps. Let's talk about prompting. Do I have any advice on how to get good at prompting? Prompting is the most important thing. I mean, it is how we communicate with the AI, so it is very important. Here's my prompting framework that I've built up over the years. So the first is to be hyper specific, as specific as possible. You can think of the AI as a really, really good junior engineer who is prone to misinterpreting things. So the more specific you are, the less room there is for misinterpretation. So here's an example of a bad prompt. It's very vague, very open-ended. I can see a thousand ways the AI can write this. Here's a more specific prompt that's still the same thing, but as you can see, there's less room for interpretation. The second thing I do is I provide a lot of visual context. You probably know you can feed in images into ChatGPT and Claude, but you can actually do the same thing in Cursor. So one thing I'm constantly doing is I'm screenshotting example UIs and error messages, and I'm just feeding it directly into Cursor. So when I was working on Lily's UI, I would try to find examples I really like. I would screenshot it, 
I would drag it into cursor and say, hey, can you implement something that looks like this? It's not gonna get it right the first time, but at least it's a very good starting point and it's enough for me to start working and iterating on. And the same thing goes for errors. Anytime I get an error, I screenshot the error, feed it into cursor, and I usually just say, hey, I'm getting this error, can you fix it? And if you do this a couple times, it usually is smart enough to resolve the error. This alone has saved me countless hours of debugging. So visual context is another important thing. So the third part of my prompting framework is to not try to do too much in the prompt and to be willing to iterate. Um, a lot of people get impatient. They try to feed in a ton of instructions to the AI in one go. But what I found is it's better to get something really basic and then plan on iterating. So instead of trying to say, I want you to build this thing and you specify 50 things it needs to do, just get the basics done, maybe two or three things in the first prompt and then be prepared to break this up into multiple prompts. Let's talk about the limits of AI. One limitation I've noticed is that it can sometimes go down rabbit holes or go down in circles and get lost, especially when you're trying to do something complex. So something I'm always on the lookout for is, is it going in a loop? Is it kind of making the same mistakes over and over again? And this awesome feature cursor has is the ability to restore to a specific checkpoint. So you can go anywhere in the chat and there's a button to restore from this checkpoint and you're basically starting from that point forward and it has no context of whatever you asked it before. And I use this feature all the time. Anytime I get a sense it's going in circles or I might've approached this wrong, I click restore and then I try another approach. So a second issue is that it likes to hallucinate API sometimes. I've especially noticed this when developing iOS apps. It really likes to make things up from the Apple documentation that doesn't exist. A way to combat this is Cursor has this awesome feature where you can actually import documentation. So for the meeting app, I fed it in the DeepGram documentation and just by feeding it in, now it has access to all the endpoints, it understands it, and it's able to use that API way more effectively. Same thing with the Apple documentation. I am regularly feeding in the Apple documentations into Cursor, and it has been amazing for reducing those hallucinations. My third point is even though AI will get it wrong sometimes, I think it's great to just push your luck and see if it's able to do it. One example where I pushed my luck, tried it, and I was completely blown away that it got it the first try was when I was working on the meeting notes generator for Lily. So I wanted a feature where users can click a button and it'll generate notes from a meeting based on the transcript. But another thing I wanted too was in the chat functionality, when you ask it, can you generate meeting notes for me? It would also do the same and it would show a button in line in the chat. I asked it in one go to build out the entire functionality for this, like the section where it'll generate the notes, the button and the chat with the inline message and it actually got it in one go. I was so convinced it wasn't going to work, but I was just curious and it actually did it. So even though there's limits, I think it's cool to just try your luck and see. So lastly, here's some things that people want me to cover just based on questions I've gotten. So what model do I use? Right now for most coding things, including web and Swift, I'm using Claude 3.7. I've noticed 3.7 is slightly better than 3.5. It is a little bit more prone to going off the rails, but I feel like the output's marginally better than 3.5 and I trust myself to stop it from going off the rails if I noticed it, so I don't mind using 3.7. I do turn on deep thinking and I've noticed I've gotten better results there. I've tried a bunch of the models, including the new Gemini, but this is the one I'm getting the most results with. Question number two is, are there any other cursor tips you have? What settings do you use? To be honest, I really don't think I'm using cursor that well. I don't use cursor rules. I don't use MCP. It's not because they're not good. I just really haven't had time to try it out or really learn it. For now, I'm just using the autocomplete in cursor and I'm using agent mode most of the time and it has been working pretty well. I'm really not doing anything fancy. Oh, but one tip that I do have is to use workspaces. I'm probably the last person to discover this and everyone already knows this, but you can actually open up multiple repos in the same cursor workspace. And when you do that and you use the chat and the agent, it has context of all the repos. This is amazing if you're working with a front end and a back end, because now that means the agent knows what the back end looks like when you make changes to the front end. So that was a really powerful thing that I've discovered and it really helps with full stack development. If you guys have any tips on how to use cursor or you know any other tools that are better, please comment below. I'm honestly trying to get better at this stuff myself. So I'd love to hear what you guys are doing. So I've been using AI tooling for about two years now. I started using GitHub Copilot when it first launched in technical preview. I was able to get my hands on it and start using it. And it was super impressive at the time, even though it was basically just a fancy autocomplete. That was enough for me, to be honest. So a lot of people used it to autocomplete their code, but the way that I was using it at the time was I would write comments of what I wanted it to do and then have it write out whatever functions or classes that I needed. So I would write something like create a function that uses the DeepGram API to pull in audio and transcribe it in real time. And when I commented this out, it would just spit the code out for me. This was super basic, but it already increased my output about 20%. Then I switched to ChatGPT and stopped using GitHub Copilot once ChatGPT got really good at coding. And I realized it was just faster for me to, instead of writing comments, just chat with it directly and say, here's my code, can you go make this change? And at the 
time, GitHub Copilot did not have the chat features because this workflow was a little bit better and I found that the code quality was the same, but I like this workflow a little bit better than writing the comments. I switched over to ChatGPT. Then I switched over to Claude because they released a model that I noticed was a lot better at Swift. And then I discovered Cursor and I started using that because I got really sick of pasting code files between Claude and between my IDE. So having Cursor was amazing because it's built into the IDE, it understood the code base and I can just chat with it directly. So I started using this for web, but I couldn't use it for Swift projects. So I still continue to use Claude for anything Swift related. Finally, when I figured out a couple weeks ago that you can actually just open an Xcode project in Cursor, go make all the changes and then switch back to Xcode, build it, see the errors and do everything you need to do. That's what I've been doing most recently. It is a little bit cumbersome to switch between Xcode and Cursor, but the efficiency I get totally outweighs that inconvenience. That's what I've been doing right now. And so that's where I'm at today. I've used a couple tools. I've also tried things like Windsurf, but overall I found the code quality with Cursor is marginally better. So I'm sticking with that for now until something changes. I want to address two questions that I often get asked. How good is AI really at coding? I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it just spits out garbage or it keeps going in circles and I end up wasting more time than if I had just coded it myself. And the answer is it is extremely good at coding and I think every single developer should learn how to use it. However, at the end of the day, it is just a tool. It's only as good as the person that's using it. It's like giving someone a multi thousand dollar DSLR camera. If you give it to a professional, they know how to use it. If you give it to someone who just shoots on their iPhone and doesn't understand things like aperture and shutter speed, they're going to take pictures. It's going to look exactly like their iPhone pictures. And they're going to say, why did I just spend $8,000 on this camera? It's not worth it at all. However, the professional would disagree with you because they know how to use it. They know how to get a lot more out of it. So for them, the $8,000 is worth it. And AI is the same way. If you don't take the time to really understand how to use it, you will get mediocre results. And to be honest, it's probably going to be faster for you to just code by hand. However, if you do take the time to understand how to use it and effectively put it in your workflow, I guarantee you will at least three X your output as a developer. So going back to the question of how good it is, that does not mean that it is perfect. I would say that I'm pretty good at using this stuff and prompting and it gets me about 90% of the way there. And then the last 10% is something that I need to usually intervene, prompt a lot or manually write the code myself. And I'm not going to downplay it. That 10% can take a very long time. I was working on this complex drag animation for my app Lily, where you can resize the panels of the app. After a couple of prompts, it technically got this thing working. So after about like five minutes, however, it took another 12 hours of work for me to get that last 12% to make it feel just right. So for example, when a user flicks and it shoots up to the top of the screen, it seems really simple, but it actually took a lot of out of the box thinking, math and iteration. And the AI was struggling to get that one on its own. I had to really prompt it a hundred times and try out a bunch of different things to get that right. And I know I'm not alone in this and I feel like other developers feel the same way that that last 10% takes so much time. Is it even worth using AI at all? And I think the answer is still yes. I am still substantially faster coding with it than without it. And that brings up the second question. Do I need to know how to code to use these tools effectively? So my honest answer is it depends on what you're building. It depends on the complexity, but on the whole, yeah, I do think you need to know how to code to use these tools effectively. And the better you are at coding, the more powerful these tools are for you. If it's a super simple app with no database and it's just like a to-do list app or a workout app just for yourself, then sure, you might be able to get away building this with very minimal knowledge or no knowledge at all. But if you're trying to build something complex, I strongly advise that you know how to code before using these tools. So I'll share a quick story of why I say that. So my brother is currently building an app. He has absolutely no idea how to code. So I pointed him at this tool called Lovable. Lovable is an AI tool where you can build prototypes. You can basically ask it, hey, build me this to-do list app and it will spit out a to-do list app. So he was using it. He was able to build a UI so quickly for his app and everything was going really well until he hooked up the database. And that's where things started going wrong very quickly. At some point, the AI changed the schema of the database in Supabase, but the front end didn't change to handle that and it started crashing. He started seeing all of these type mismatch errors. As someone with coding experience, I see this error and I'm like, oh, okay, this is easy. It just means that the schema in the database in the front end are not matching. We need to just change one of them. But he doesn't have coding experience. So when he saw that, he started freaking out and asking it, hey, can you fix this? Can you fix this? Can you fix this? And it kept going in circles until at some point, Lovable decided to wipe the database and rebuild the schema. I was honestly shocked when I saw that, but that got me thinking, okay, number one, thank God this is not in production. And number two, this can get really dangerous if you don't know what you're doing if you don't have coding experience and you're building a complex app like this. So after seeing stuff like this over and over again, my position is it is really advisable that if you build something complex, especially with production data and users, I really think you should learn to code or make some coding friends before using these AI coding tools. I hope that you guys found this video helpful. I really encourage you if you're a developer to try to use some of these AI toolings. I've seen way too many developers try it out. They 
get some really bad response and then they just kind of dismiss it and say, okay, this thing is worthless. Or they have one bad experience where it's going in circles and they're like, I can just do this faster myself. But I really believe that these tools can supercharge any developer's workflow, especially if you're already a good developer. I truly believe that the developers who are gonna thrive for the next decade are not the ones who fight against this stuff, but they're the ones who learn to embrace and build with it. Hopefully this video convinced you to try it out. If you like this content, check out my Instagram and TikTok. I post almost every other day about building productivity apps. And obviously if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe. But thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.